So, uh, in today's lecture, I am going to talk about the remaining part of uh, RDNA technology. So, today I will go through a one specific example and try to show you how to design a cloning experiment. Um, what I am going to do is a very basic experiment where we are going to clone a particular gene into a vector and then insert that into a bacterial system. So, I will talk about designing a PCR reaction. So, this is the crux of this experiment and then I will talk about how you do restriction digestion ligation and finally, transform this ligated product into a bacterial cell. And as usual I will talk about the practical aspects of these experiments. So, this is again the overview of this uh, cloning process this is the source of the DNA. So, it can be a human cDNA from which we want to extract out a particular gene sequence and that we will do by PCR. So, today we will see how you design primers so that you can specifically extract out this particular gene from this uh, cDNA. We will also get our plasmid or vector from a bacteria and both will be digested using restriction enzyme and then finally, joined together using our glue enzymatic glue which is ligase to get this vector that will be inserted into the bacteria. So, we will use a particular strain BL21 D3 which will express the protein and if you want to ex, uh, purify that protein you can do that from here. So, this is our complete cloning experiment. So, here we start with the sequence of our protein. So, the sequence of the protein is shown here. Again, this is the phi, um, so this is the gene sequence and this is the 5 prime end of the gene and this is the 3 prime end of the gene and the nucleotide sequence is divided into 3 blocks. So, each of these is a codon which codes for a particular amino acid. So, if you count there are um, 77 amino acids in this gene sequence. What we and remember that this is part of a much bigger DNA. So, it does not end here in these two regions. So, this extends in this direction and this also extends in this direction. So, we have to design a PCR reaction so that we can extract out exactly this part from this very big chromosomal DNA and we will do that using these two primers. So, again this black lines represent the two strands of this very long DNA and these two green lines represent the gene of our interest. So, the first one the red one is the forward primer which is complementary to the, so this top strand is the coding strand which is this sequence. Okay. So, the bottom strand is complementary to the top strand or this actual gene sequence. Now, this primer is complementary to the bottom strand which means that this primer sequence will be exactly the same as this top strand. So, designing this forward primer is very easy. All you have to do is take a sequence from this 5 prime end of your gene and the length of the primer will depend on the melting temperature of that particular sequence. So, we want the melting temperature to be somewhere close to 65 degree centigrade between 60 to 65 degree centigrade. So, in this case what I have done is I have chosen a primer up to this point. So, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So, that is 27 nucleotide long primer. For the reverse primer it will be complementary to the coding strand. So, this is 5 prime, this is 3 prime, it means this will be 5 prime and this will be 3 prime and that is exactly what I have written here. So, it will be towards the 3 prime end of your gene 
and this is the 5 prime end. So, all you have to do is simply do a complement. Okay. So, again I have taken a primer which is this long and then if you want to order these primers normally we send them as a 5 prime to 3 prime end sequences. So, the forward primer sequence is very easy. It is exactly the same as the beginning of your gene sequence while the reverse primer is the complement and then you have to reverse it because we want to write the 5 prime towards the left end and 3 prime towards the right end. So, that is why it is called a reverse complement. So, this is the reverse primer and now you have these two primers for your PCR reaction. But this is not all because you will notice that there is no stop codon at the end of this gene. So, here is the genetic code and these are all the codons that are listed. Remember that the first one is methionin. So, if I go back you can see that the first one ATG codes for methionin. So, that is the start codon and then there are these three stop codons, but all these three stop codons none of these are present at the end of our gene of interest. So, we will have to introduce this stop codon and we can use our reverse primer to introduce this stop codon. So, what I will do is I will use this TAA as our stop codon. So, again that stop codon will come after this last amino acid. So, it should be TAA. Now, since I am doing it as a complement, this will become ATT because here it is TAA. So, the complement is ATT. So, now my primer will have this extra sequences from the 5 prime end which is TTA. So, now I write my reverse primer as TTA and then this part remains exactly the same. Okay. So, now I have using my re reverse primer I have added this stop codon which was missing in the original gene sequence. Now, the next, so these are the two primers that I have. So, again going back to our cloning strategy, once you have the PCR product and once you have the empty vector, so this is we call them call it as an empty vector because it does not have our gene of interest encoded in it. We will have to ligate this into this and to do that we have to first digest both the empty vector and the PCR product by a set of two restriction enzymes. The reason we use two restriction enzymes is that then these restriction enzymes will cut somewhere here which is the multiple cloning site as I discussed in the last lecture. So, the multiple cloning site encodes for different restriction enzymes. So, if we use two restriction enzymes then what you get is two different overhangs in this end. So, you can see clearly that this overhang is different from this overhang so that it will not be able to go and complete this plasmid. So, it will not again go back to a circular plasmid. By using the same set of restriction enzyme on our PCR product, we will generate a restriction digested um, PCR product. Now, you can see that this complements very well with this and this complements very well with this. So, that when you put them together they can form the correct hydrogen bonds and you add ligase to form this circular vector with your gene of interest. So, in this example if you go through any vector you will see there are so many different uh, restriction enzymes. So, you will have to choose restriction enzymes whose restriction sites do not appear in your gene of interest. Otherwise, these restriction enzymes will cut in the middle of your PCR product. So, you do not want that. So, you have to be very careful in choosing restriction enzymes which will not cut anywhere between your PCR product or the gene of interest. So, these sequences should not be present in your gene of interest. So, we have done that and we have chosen these two particular enzymes. So, NDE1 cuts like this. So, there will be a small overhang of two bases and BAM H1 cuts like this. So, that there will be an overhang of four bases. You can see 
that one side will have two over base overhang and the other side will have four base overhang and they will not be able to recombine. So, that will prevent the spontaneous uh, cyclization of our empty vector once they are digested by these two restriction enzymes. We are going to use exactly the same two restriction enzymes to digest our PCR product. So, now how do we insert these restriction sites in our PCR product? So, again we are going to do that by our designed primers. So, one of the restriction in uh, sites will be encoded before the start of the gene sequence. So, towards this 5 prime end and the other one will be encoded after the stop codon. So, towards this, so in the gene it will be towards the 3 prime end, but again in the 5 prime end of our reverse primer. So, it will be towards the 5 prime end of both primers. So, here is the now redesigned forward primer. So, you will see that starting from this ATG to this ACT is here ATG to this ACT. What we have done is we have added these extra nucleotides towards the 5 prime end. So, this CAT and these two. So, this CAT and ATG is it codes for NDE1. So, we have the NDE1 restriction site in our forward primer. Okay. Similarly, for the reverse primer, we are using the other restriction site. So, again from TTA to GAC is TTA to GAC and we have added these two sequences which codes for the other restriction enzyme which is BAM H1, GGA, TCC, GGA, TCC and then again we have this extra sequences. So, you will see that this is GC, GC, GC. So, GCs form 3 hydrogen bonds and that uh, stabilizes the uh, annealing of the primer with your DNA sequence. So, these, so we put this GC clamps towards the end of our primer so that the annealing is much better. So, now we have our forward primer with the design restriction site and the reverse primer with a stop codon and another restriction site. So, now you are ready to do the PCR experiment. So, here we have a typical PCR setup. So, this is a PCR thermocycler. So, all this instrument does is basically it will go through different temperatures in a cyclic fashion. The way you set up your experiment is you mix all these different components in a small Eppendorf tube or any tube, any PCR tube. Um, these are uh, the standard size is 200 microliter tube and then you make up a total volume of 50 microliters. So, out of that roughly 30 microliter is water. So, remember you start with this and then you add the 10 x buffer, then you add your template, the two primers, DNTP mix. So, DNTP mix is the mixture of ATP, GTP, CTP and TTP. These are the monomers that make the DNA molecule. And in the last step, when you have added everything, you add the polymerase which is the enzyme. So, TAC polymerase is the one which is thermostable. You add it at the end and then you put it in your PCR instrument and start the reaction. So, this is again one of our a typical PCR cycle that we use. So, it goes in three steps. The first one is where the temperature is increased to 95 degree centigrade. So, at this high temperature all the DNA molecules are denatured meaning the double strands come apart. So, now they become single stranded. So, this is just done once and then these three steps are repeated 35 times. So, in these three steps the first one is again denaturation. So, we heat our reaction mixture for 30 seconds so that all the DNA molecules come apart. There is no hydrogen bond between them. Now, you cool it down to 61 degree centigrade. 
this is the annealing temperature and you have to be careful about this annealing temperature. So, this is something that you set based on your primer sequence. So, there are many websites where you can put your primer sequence and it will tell you the melting point of your primer. So, based on the melting point of the forward and the reverse primer, you will set this annealing temperature and that is set for 45 seconds and then the temperature is raised to 72 degree centigrade which is optimal for this polymerase enzyme. So, the temperature is raised to 72 degree centigrade and it is run for 1 minute. Now, again this timing is set based on the length of your gene of interest. So, every for every enzyme it will tell you how long it takes to synthesize a particular length of a DNA. So, based on that information you will set this elongation time and then this cycle is these 3 steps are repeated 35 times and finally, we have a longer elongation time so that uh, all the products which were half done will get completed and then you bring the whole system down to 4 degree centigrade. So, a typical reaction for this uh, type of cloning will take somewhere between 1 and half hours to 2 hours. So, you can set up this experiment, wait for 2 hours, come back and then you have to check whether your PCR experiment worked or not. To do that, we have to go back to gel electrophoresis. So, once we have done PCR using these two primers, um, we have again a colorless liquid and to check whether our PCR reaction worked, we have run this agarose gel. Remember this is DNA. So, for DNA we used we have to use agarose gel and these are much bigger DNA molecules. And since we want to look at a PCR product which is very small, the expected length of our PCR product is 237 base pair. So, that is why we have used a dense agarose gel. So, it is a 1 percent agarose gel. This first lane is the molecular standard molecular weight marker and you can see all the molecular weights are listed here and this in this lane we have run our PCR reaction, a small part of our PCR reaction and you can see that there is nothing else and there is a very clean band which means that the reaction has worked really well and it is less than 500 base pair. So, it is 237 base pair that is expected. So, most likely this is the correct product. So, now we can go ahead with this and do the restriction digestion. So, you have to take this PCR product, add the two restriction enzymes, incubate it for some time. So, these are all prescribed by the enzymes where uh, that you buy, it's there, it, it will be in the enzyme catalog and then you will have your restriction enzyme digested PCR product. The other part that you need is the circular vector uh, which should be also digested by your restriction enzyme. So, you have to set up two reactions of restriction digestion, one is for this PCR product and then the other is for your circular vector. And whether that reaction worked or not is again tested by another agarose gel electrophoresis. So, here another agarose gel is run is shown. So, you can see that the same molecular weight marker is run here. This lane is the intact circular vector and this lane is the digested vector. So, this lower band originates from this circular vector because since it is circular it actually runs faster and when this vector is cut open it becomes slower. So, its migration becomes slower and you get a band which is slightly shifted upward. You will notice that these lanes are much smaller and this lane is much bigger. So, what has been done here is two or maybe three lanes like this have been joined together to create a much bigger lane. So, that all of the reaction product can be run at the same time. The reason we do that is because when you set up a digestion reaction, you will have it will not be 100 percent. So, in this gel we actually see a single band, we do not see a band down here. So, it is almost 
very close to the completion, but in many cases you will see two bands which means that the digestion reaction is not complete. So, in that case you will have to separate out this digested vector from the undigested vector because if the undigested vector is there then it will also get transformed into your bacterial cells and there will be no way you can tell which cells has which cell has your vector with your gene of interest and which cell has the empty vector. So, in that case if you see two bands then you will have to cut out this band and purify the digested vector from this band. So, that is why we run a gel where we fuse several lanes together and run all the digested product. So, this band was cut out and purified using standard kits where you can extract the DNA from this agarose gel. So, now you have your digested vector, you have your digested PCR and you can put them together. So, we have our digested vector, we have our digested PCR product, we can add them together and add our ligase and again this reaction takes some, some time. So, depending on the enzyme that you use, you will have to set up a reaction and it is always advisable to use different ratios of the vector and the PCR product and set up at least 2 and if possible 3 or 4 reactions with different ratios because you do not know which one is going to work. And then you take your ligation product and transform it into bacterial cells and you plate those bacterial cells. So, the way this is done if you remember from the last lecture these vectors have a selectable marker. So, in this case let us say the selectable marker is canamycin. So, only those bacterial cells which take up this vector will have that selectable marker. So, in our agar plate we have we add canamycin. So, the E. coli cells which have this vector will survive and all other cells which do not have this vector will die off. So, you transform your bacteria with this vector, you plate it on an agar plate, put it in an incubator at 37 degree centigrade overnight and come back next morning to see whether your whether you get colonies. So, there are two types of bacterial cells that we use, one is DH5 alpha and the other one is BL21 lambda DE3. So, the DH5 alpha bacterial cells are the ones which are used when you do this cloning reaction. So, you will add your ligation product to these bacterial cells, plate them and next morning when you come back you see these white spots, these are the colonies that have grown overnight. So, these are the cells which took the plasmid in and have survived in this agar plate which also has canamycin because the plasmid has the selectable marker. So, then you pick one of these colonies, you can run a PCR again with the primers and if that PCR works you know that the plasmid is inserted in this and then you can keep that as a stock in the lab. This type of cells are typically used to maintain a plasmid library because they, so these we do not use these DH5 alpha cells to make our protein. To make proteins, to overexpress the protein, we use a different cell which is BL21 lambda DE3. So, you have to extract out the vector from these bacterial cells and transform them into this type of cells and again the process is same, you wait uh, incubate it at 37 degree centigrade overnight, next you come back and you will see colonies like this and you can pick one of these colonies and then you have your clone that you can use to express your protein of interest. So, all the other experiments that you want to do will be done using these clones that is picked from a plate like this. So, this is the overview of our cloning experiment. So, today what we have done is we have designed a PCR experiment, we have designed 
primers to do the PCR experiment so that we can extract out our gene of interest. And the way we design the primer is such that we extract out the gene of interest, we amplify it, we also encoded a stop codon and we also designed sites for restriction digestion. And then we use that restriction, two restriction enzymes to digest our PCR product, digest our vector, then we used ligase to ligate these two digested products and then transform them into our bacteria of interest for production of protein. So, again these are the books that uh, we have followed and thank you very much.